I just want to thank all of you for coming. It's such an honor to be reading here at Medgar Evers. Um, thank uh, President Jackson for hosting this event. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to Mr. Jenkins and the whole staff that put together this presidential lecture series. Um, and many, many thanks to Provost Nunez, who I'm honored to be reading with on stage. It's quite a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm going to be reading from my story that's in this text called Trinidad Noir. I'm going to be reading from the last story, which is mine. Um, the story, its frame is set in a coffin shop, a shop that, that actually sells caskets. And the owner of this coffin shop, his name is Corban, he's having a hard time selling recently. And so he decided to take some of this into his own hands um, so he might have better sales. Uh, my main character is Gita, and she is hanging out with her friend Leslie in the passage that I'm going to read to you. Gita's mother has recently passed away, and Gita decides that she's going to mourn her mother's passing by doing all the things her mother wouldn't let her do. So she starts wearing mini skirts, she starts dating boys that she wasn't allowed to date before, she starts going clubbing, she's in high school. She decides she's going to apply to college, do all kind of stuff that she um, wasn't allowed to do when her mom was alive. And the story is set in Shagarama. So I'm going to be reading from this section where uh, Gita, whose name is also Pinky, um, and her friend Leslie are getting ready to go to the club um, that's in Shagaramas. My idea at the club is that it's Anchorage Club. Y'all know Anchorage from Trinity's? Man, y'all need to go back home and go clubbing. Um, this um, piece starts with them getting ready. That night, Pinky wore a dress to match her name. A magenta dress that wasn't even hers. The sluttiest thing I own, said Leslie laughing. But Pinky didn't laugh. She looked at herself in the mirror and thought of her mother in her red wedding sari. In the picture, her father wore a European suit and had thick sideburns. Her father looked like a child of an era. Her mother looked errorless. She was not sure which was better. Now she looked at herself in the mirror and puckered. Her dress was spandex and it stuck and it stretched. It was open at the back and ended above the knees. There was a slit at the left thigh. Pinky thought that she would never look like this again. But in the next instant, she said out loud, this is what I always want to look like. The club was not the hot, smoky place she had expected. It was cool with AC inside, and there was a big balcony out by the water. Scope the place out first, shouted Leslie, as the entry bands were fastened around their wrists. Stay away from the nasty old men. They walked in. They kept their backs straight. They flipped their hair. Leslie had taught her the screw face. This club was about attitude. Don't smile unless you see someone you know. And then hug and air kiss. And if it's a guy, wait for him to offer a drink. Never say no to a free drink. And never buy your own drink. It was a masquerade. They were pretty. They were desirable. Everyone was supposed to know it. When you dance, make sure you're not dancing next to a girl who could dance better than you. <laughs> make sure to establish eye contact with a good looking man, but let him come over to you first. Dance when you're tired. Dance even if you're sweaty and tired. Take off your shoes if you need to. You can keep them behind at the DJ booth. Only stop dancing if a guy offers you a drink. And then ask for something good. What's good? Get like a sex on the beach, or a fuzzy navel, or a blowjob. No, don't get that. That's taking it too far. Never get what he's having. Mandrakes taste nasty. Like Long Island iced tea? That's disgusting. That's a get drunk drink. You just want to look good when you hold in a glass. In fact, stick to sex on the beach. It matches your dress. And me, I'll get blue lagoons all night. The old man against the walls watched the girls like a movie. Outside on the deck, Pinky and Leslie drank their colorful drinks bought by forgettable boys and cooled off with the sea breeze. Pinky's hair was plastered onto her face. It wasn't so hot inside, but they had been dancing and sweating. The DJ had played hip hop and rock, but not Calypso yet. Pinky didn't really know how to move to hip hop or rock. She was waiting for soca. They play it last, said Leslie. No Mateo, 
Gita said out loud and felt relieved, and then disappointed by her own relief. No Mateo yet, you wait, girl. Leslie lit a tiny black cigar with a plastic tip. She blew out over the balcony. When the bells and the knocking of Calypso came on, Leslie flicked her cigarillo over the side of the balcony, and they left their drinks. Inside, the dance floor was crowded. Women had their, skirt, their skirts hoisted up, and men had their hands in the air. People were dancing in the corner by the tables and on top of the couches. Women leaned on the backs of chairs to steady themselves. Leslie and Pinky didn't look for an empty space. They simply walked in and danced where they ended up. Pinky felt good now. She didn't need Mateo after all. She swung her hips and her heavy, wet hair, and then, just like that, Mateo came up behind her as though it was something he did often. He had that rich, musky smell, and he held her hips in his hands as he pulled her body closer to his. Her first thought was, this is not right. Her next thought was, this is so right. <laughs> Everyone in the club was screaming the words to the song. Everyone was knocking hips into one another. The bass beat twice, and people stomped their feet twice. Pinky put her hands over Mateo so she could follow his rhythm. She looked around, realizing that Leslie was not beside her, but then there she was. A white girl was hard to miss in the dark club. Leslie had her palms flat on the wall, her arms straight and stiff, and her backside was rolling on the crotch of a man who was old enough to act cool about the friction. It seemed so odd, all of this, all this display, all this. And after Christmas break, they'd be back in their class uniforms, and perhaps that was its own kind of pretend. Mateo turned her around so they faced each other. And though this was less vulgar because less of their bodies were touching, it seemed more intimate. He leaned his face into her neck, and she felt his lips on her wet skin, as if he had tapped directly onto her spine. She shivered and pulled back. And then she left the dance floor. Mateo stood there for a moment before following her out. You OK, he asked once they were outside. Yeah, you OK? Yeah. They were quiet for several moments. I wanted to kiss you in there, he said. I know. Can I, uh, can I kiss you now? I don't know. <laughs> can I try? She nodded. He leaned forward, and she turned to give him her cheek. Pinky, if we get married, we're going to be doing a lot more than kissing. <laughs> what? And then he kissed her open mouth, and she felt his soft lips and his wet tongue, and she jumped back. And she smiled and backed away some more, and then she ran away into the cavern of the club, her heels clinking on the deck like knocking bones. She'd had her first kiss, and it had been with Mateo Diaz, and had he asked her to marry him? This was like a Bollywood movie, except with real kissing. She needed to talk to Leslie. But inside, the dance floor was a living mass of its own. It was hot and steamy now, and the people were not concerned about the expensiveness of their dresses or the intricateness of their hairdos. The floor was sticky and difficult to walk on in Leslie's heels. Mateo had kissed her, and now Gita did not know what to do. It had felt animal-like. It had felt slutty even. She didn't want to see him again, but she wanted to see him every day for the rest of her life. And that was silly. Did she really believe that Mateo Diaz was the kind of boy who kissed a girl and then married her? Was he? He would want sex first, or at least dating a little. He would want to fool around with American girls in college and all that, wouldn't he? Would he? Why would he say something so serious if he wasn't serious? She felt sick. Her head felt sick. She felt as though she had to get away from the crowd. Are you tight, someone asked. She shook her head, but thought she might throw up. Man, Pinky Manachandi is tight. <laughs> she wandered to the bathroom, then hiked up her pink dress and sat on the toilet and felt as though the kiss and the drink were finally gone from her. When she emerged, she felt better but more stupid. Had she even kissed Mateo? And had she ran away afterwards? Someone grabbed her wrist gently. It felt protective. She looked up, expecting to see her father. The older man, not her father, leaned into her face. You don't look good. I'm not. You need some water. He was wearing a Panama hat, fitting tight and low. 
he offered her his open bottle. She wasn't used to drinking alcohol, so the water seemed like a savior. She took it and drank steadily, drank the whole bottle before she knew it. It felt clean, it tasted sweet. I'm sorry, sir. She handed him back the empty bottle. Sir, said the man with amusement. Well, I haven't been alive that much longer than you. Gita didn't know how to feel about this, but now she peered at him and thought he looked kind of familiar. She squinched up her eyes at him. It wasn't a bad feeling, this familiarity, but it felt dark like a secret. He squinched his eyes back at her. Then, without smiling or without saying goodbye, he slipped into the men's room with his empty water bottle. Where you been? Leslie's voice, suddenly next to hers, was hoarse. In the bathroom. You was puking? I don't know. Mateo, just tell me he kissed you, and then you run away. He's lying. Oh, man, Pinky, now what you gonna do? You like him like that? I gonna marry him. My dad will let me do anything. He visits with my dead mother at night. What are you talking about? Nothing. Are you boyfriend and girlfriend now? I don't think so. Gita watched the door of the men's room and waited for the man to come out. She wanted to remember who he was. You should find out, Leslie paused. Do you even have his number? Who? Oh no, I don't think so. Pinky, are you high or something? What the hell, go give him your number. They walked around the club that was now playing its jazzy theme song. People were leaving, the lights went on like a wide search beam. People looked human and raw. Some stood around and waited. Others talked loudly about heading out to a new club in Port of Spain that stayed open later. No one was dancing anymore. The dance floor looked like a sad, dirty place. Mateo wasn't there. Outside, they stumbled over the pebbles to Pinky's car. I'll drive, Leslie offered. That's OK, said Pinky. She sat in the driver's seat of the SUV that had been her mother's. She started the engine and rolled down the windows with the automatic buttons. Hey, Pinky, stop running away from me, girl. Ooh, whispered Leslie from the passenger seat. Mateo, good. Pinky put the car back in park and told her heart to stop slamming against the inside of her chest, asked her brain to stop floating around in her head. She wanted really to drive away. She wanted really to wave and honk her horn like the others were doing, and then find the main road, and then go to school in January, and wait to see if Barnard had accepted her, and then wait to see if she actually wanted to go after all. But instead, her palms sprung water and slipped off the steering wheel. Pinky, can I get your number? She nodded but didn't turn to look at him. Her head might fall off. It felt that soupy. Is this what love feels like, she thought. Mateo leaned into the car window. Pinky girl, I'm not messing with you. I know this has to be on the low because of your pops, but I'm for real. However you want it, girl, give me your cell. She kept her hands in her lap. Leslie dug the little magenta purse and pulled out Pinky's cell phone. He tapped his number in. I put in Mary. That can be my code name. That way when I'm calling, no one knows it's a guy. And then he backed off a little. Good night, Les. You take care of my girl. Leslie smiled and waved and reached over to honk Pinky's horn. Now drive away, Pinky, she said under her breath. Pinky put the SUV in gear and drove. I have a boyfriend, she said as the sea air whipped around them on the highway. The air made her head feel less swimmy, kept her palms dry. You have a man, Pinky, now what are you gonna do with him? Girl, I have no idea. She drove faster, she wanted the air. She and Leslie were careening into their happiness. They were nearing Alcoa, where her father worked. Pinky thought, father, and then remembered the Catholic priest, and then she finally remembered where she knew the man in the Panama hat from, the coffin shop. He was the owner, she smiled. There was something funny about the man. He had been so mad when she touched his one, in, one wing plane back in the shop. He was nice to have given her the water in the club, though. Did he remember her? Is that why he was so nice? The water had been sweet. Maybe it was coconut water. This thought made Gita laugh out loud. The laughter made her head float. Leslie glanced over at her. What was so funny? But they had already gotten to the narrow loop in the road before the aluminum warehouse. Pinky turned the wheel into the dark corner. There was a sudden blare of another car's horn. Then the invasive brights of the other car's headlights. Pinky let the wheel pull away from her. She released her hands and raised her foot off the gas. She saw the Alcoa dock as though it was a solitary arm reaching into the sea as in welcome. 
Leslie saw her friend's hand raised above the wheel. She felt the car slam into the railing, felt it lift as though alive and turn, turn until upside down. Her body stiffened in anticipation. The fear was like metal on her tongue. Hold on, she tried to scream, hold on. But the words were too slow. They hit the water like a wall. The wall gave way. Then it was dark and they were underwater and they were in a sinking car and they were upside down. Thank y'all. Good morning. Or I think it's afternoon by now, I was late, sorry. Any Trinidadians here? So you're familiar with the concept of Trinidad time, so. No, really, it's the train. I blame the train. That's my story, and I'm, that's right. Um, I'm actually a contributor to the book, and I'm also one of the co-editors. So um, it was a really exciting trip, you know, doing this, um, this collection. I remember when I first met with the publisher, uh, Johnny Temple of Akashic Books, who is actually here today. Um, and he was talking about doing something called Port of Spain Noir. Akashic Books does this collection of um, this uh, series of crime stories called Akashic Noir. And they, they have done Brooklyn Noir, Bronx Noir, Manhattan Noir, San Francisco, London, Dublin. Anybody know Trinidad? You know Port of Spain? How much times Port of Spain could fit into any one of those cities? Plenty, right? So I said, well, I don't know if Port of Spain has enough space, locations, to do the kind of book that you're talking about. So why don't we say, instead of Port of Spain, do the island of Trinidad? And so that's how this book was born. When you do pick it up, you'll notice that the stories are not traditional noir, which is a kind of a gritty crime fiction, often set in urban locations. We've actually got some stories set in the country, um, in, in, in Trinidad. And um, our, our stories are not all crime stories. Some of them are more what we call atmospherically noir. And, um, but we've got a lot of good um, response. I look forward to hearing what you think of it. So without much more blather, I'll read a little bit from my story in the collection, which is called Pot Luck. Now at this point, my lead character is a guy called Trey. And Trey has what is called a tabanka. Do you know what that is? I'm sorry that you know what that is. Tabanka is a really bad, broken heart. The kind where you don't eat. I, I don't have that kind. <laughs> the kind where you don't eat and you don't want to see nobody, you don't bathe, you don't, I mean, it's terrible, terrible, you know? So he had that tabanka. And he went to deal with his tabanka in the country by his cousin, Danny. And, um, just before this scene, he and Danny were sitting down smoking some marijuana, <laughs> which is a drug. I'm sure you don't know what it is, but it's, um, <laughs> it's a drug. It, yeah, I know, you've never heard of it, right? It's terrible. Uh, so he was just sitting on the... <laughs> Control yourself, boy. He's sitting on the on the beach with his cousin smoking. And then the cousin leaves and he goes for a walk in the forest. Beyond the road, the San Susi forest towered, dim and green and forbidding. In two months, Trey had only been in the forest twice, both times with his cousin. They had gone to find a certain spring with which Danny swore had the sweetest water in the world but they had become lost in the undergrowth and never found it. They made do with the chlorinated water piped in by the public utility, but Trey craved the fresh, untreated water of the spring. 
He stubbed the cigarette out in the sand and rose, grabbing his board and heading toward the forest in bounding strides. Bareback and barefoot, his lean, muscular body quickly maneuvered the path. His calloused feet barely registered the bumpy pitch of the Toku Road before he was in the cool mulch of the forest. It was rainy season, but the ground wasn't sodden, only damp and spongy with fallen leaves and topsoil. He had no idea where he was going, but with a quick glance around for a landmark, Trey moved into the woods. He passed a giant immortel tree, a clump of stunted cocoa trees, a dead one stretched across what could have been a track. The gloom deepened as he walked, the trees becoming larger and taller, the ground softer and cooler despite the mid-afternoon heat. The light changed. It was somehow brighter, more airy. A sloped clearing appeared, full of lime green leafy shrubs, about a head taller than his six feet. Taras, he breathed, breaking into the space gingerly and leaving his surfboard behind. The weed was planted in even rows, smelling pungent, sweet, musky. As far as he could see, marijuana trees were coming into bloom, their small orange flowers just starting to show, plants ripe for the picking. Making his way through the rows, Trey tenderly brushed the leaves and stems. He almost missed the hut in the center of the field, stumbling when he noticed the galvanized steel sheeting that made up its walls and roof. The double gate, also corrugated sheets of steel, bore a heavy iron padlock threaded through a thick steel chain, looped into a pair of holes in the gates. The message was clear. Keep out. To Trey, that was as good as an invitation. He walked the entire field until his feet were sore and covered in mud. There wasn't a soul in sight. He picked his way back to the galvanized shed and peered through the, the holes in the gate. It was dark inside and he couldn't see much, just large hanging shapes. The smell, however, was unmistakable. It was exactly the same weed he had just been cleaning. Trey turned and ran for the road, leaving his surfboard behind as a bright orange marker to light his way back to paradise. Sit back, relax. First thing I'm going to tell you is this is fiction, and the eye in the story is not this eye. Writers use a trick when they write, and there's something called the eye persona. So we use it for a certain effect. We are writing a, a, a novel, and we may choose to use it in third person, or we may choose to write first person. But you should never mix the first person in a story with the person who wrote it, OK? Here we go. Lucille, <coughs> Lucille, who lived next door to me, was my best friend in Trinidad. And it seemed I alone knew that she wore her surname like an albatross around her neck. Her surname was Smart. She was Lucille Smart. And obvious to anyone, painfully so to Lucille, she was anything but smart. Though I must admit, she was in no way duncier than I was. We both had to repeat exhibition class and we were dangerously close to 13 years old when we finally won that coveted seat to St. Joseph's Convent Secondary School. But perhaps Lucille was smarter than I was. Perhaps it was, carrying, it was the burden of carrying around that surname that wore her down, chipped at her confidence until she began to believe the rumors whispered about her. Lucille Smart is not smart. Lucille Smart is Duncy. Lucille Smart was a smart because her father was a smart, but, her, but she was not the same smart as her whole older brother and sister who were children of her, deceased, her father's deceased first wife. The year we took exhibition exams for the first time, her brother Antoine won an island scholarship. And his sister Lucille, his sister Suzette, 
Lucille's half-sister won a Jerningham silver medal. So they were both bright. But Lucille's burden was not only the cruel irony of being permanently welded to a name that so perfectly suited her siblings and was so perfectly unsuitable for her. It was the seeming unfairness of being darker than her sister and her brother. For in a society where light skin was prized, she was considered unattractive at least less attractive than her light-skinned sister, who had the good fortune of having a light-skinned mother. And that's quote, unquote. Lest the reader come to the conclusion that Lucille was oversensitive and paranoid, here are some facts. Lucille and her half-sister went to the same secondary school. Suzette was invited to join the school choir where all the girls coincidentally were as light-skinned, if not lighter skinned than she. Lucille, who to any rational thinking person had a better singing voice than Suzette, failed the audition in the choir. Suzette was assigned to the schoolhouse where again, all the girls were of the same complexion. In Lucille's schoolhouse, all the girls were dark-skinned. Suzette played lawn hockey when sailing in the yacht club with the other girls in her class. At carnival, Suzette played in the band where the darkest girl was merely tanned. Suzette kept a wide berth from her sister in school, though she was friendly enough with her at home. Do any of you know that story? That is the story, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to sort of go really fast on it, but I want to tell you that that's, that part of the story is going to connect to me. Um, in my day, when I went to school in Trinidad, we had a colonial government. And in those days, and unfortunately, to some extent to these days, the color of your skin was like money. Anyhow, the story goes on that um, these two girls get, they go to private school after uh, class because they're not so, so bright. So even though they get into the secondary school, and I will confess, I did tell you I'm not the I, but there are some parallels. I will confess that that was true for me too. I do not know where Lucille went and what she was doing when I was sitting for A-level exams. Lucille, who longed for attention and approval, not for what she did, but for who she was, succumbed to the hot passion of a boy who did not love her. Ashamed when she became pregnant, her parents squirreled her away to a distant great aunt in Harlem. Hers is too much of a Caribbean story. It is a story noir, not of guns and daggers, not of high crimes and misdemeanors, that cause havoc on the corporeal frame, but a story noir nonetheless of crimes and misdemeanor, dis misdemeanors against the spirit that feeds, and this is a quote from Hamlet, against the spirit that feeds the canker that galls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed. It's a cautionary tale. You know what that means? It's a warning. Thank you very much. Du Bois said, we want our children educated. The school system in the country districts of the South is a disgrace. And in few towns and cities are Negro schools what they ought to be. We want the national government to step in and wipe out illiteracy. And I think we will feel that way right now. Either the U.S. will destroy ignorance or ignorance will destroy the U.S. And the second one is by Bob Moses. The leadership is there. If you go out and work with your people, then the leadership will emerge. We don't know who they are now. We don't need to know. But the leadership will emerge from the movement that emerges. Uh, these leaders knew that they must educate youth 
to become critical thinkers and understand the enormous contradictions that lie within the world they live. They knew that they had to develop the written and spoken tools that would empower them to become fighters in the struggle against a racially divided America. It is this understanding of men like Paul Moses, W.E. Du Bois, and women like Septima Clark and Mary McLeod Bethune that define a different and more empowering education in, for African Americans. And it is their work that informed the Central Brooklyn community activists that built this college. These men and women knew, like their forebears before them, that without education, there can be no leaders. They knew that in a Brooklyn community where there was enormous poverty and where only 4% of the population were professionals, a college was needed to create the talented tent that Du Bois spoke of or the leadership that Bob Moses believed was essential to move a community to new levels of achievement. Those central Brooklyn activists wanted an educated populace who could lead and contribute to the fight for social justice that was taking place in the um, active and dramatic 60s in New York. They wanted to uplift the community. They wanted to create a radically different New York and a radically different America. Today, we do have a somewhat different America though there's still a lot of work to be done. These founders envision an America where excellent leadership grows out of excellent education, but had little idea that an excellent education would produce the 44th president of the US, an African American named Barack Hussein Obama, an intellectually and politically savvy leader. Leadership and the struggle for social justice march hand in hand with education. And it's up to us to continue that march. This is the legacy that our community embraced as they fought tireless, tirelessly, without pay, as they met weekly and sometimes nightly, while holding down a full-time job in order to push CUNY Board of Higher Education and the New York City politicians for a four-year college in this community, a college which remains unique in all of CUNY. Our founders were both audacious and visionary, and as students and faculty, we must also be audacious and visionary. If we are, come, if we are to come, continue the tradition out of which we were born. In the second part, I am talking about a little bit about how I came to write this story uh, and the meaning of weather to me. Though Dr. Taylor's story and my story are different, in some ways they overlap. Both Dr. Taylor and myself were part of the 60s, struggle for more just and equal society. And so we had many overlapping ideas. I came to Medverbis College in 1973. And many of you may not have been born then, I believe. Am I right? <laughs> okay. With my two children, uh, and uh, David and Miriam, age five and seven. And I said that because I brought my kids to school lots of times when I couldn't get a babysitter, like my students did when I was teaching. Um, I had been a new, born a New Yorker, and like many of my students, were the first in my family to go to college, and the first to obtain a doctorate, a title my parents had no conception of its meaning. They were Russian immigrants and Polish immigrants, respectively. Though they valued a college education, four years was enough, they said. Time to stay home and raise my kids. But this was only my, uh, but this was not my vision. And so, after finishing my coursework at Ohio State University, I came to Medgar. It was at Medgar Evers College that this Brooklyn Jewish girl found meaning and a home. 
So much of the world at Medgar reminded me of the Brooklyn I knew. And so much, and was more comforting than the colder world, Anglo-Saxon world of Ohio State University Graduate School, where my look and style was always somewhere different and somewhat odd. Here, everyone talked with their hands, like I did, had very curly hair, like I did, always hugged and kissed when meeting and saying goodbye, like I did, and always liked a lot of good food at events, like I did. In the 70s, life at Medgar was hectic as we struggled against the imposition of, cu of tuition on CUNY. I don't know how many of you know this, but CUNY was free until 1976, I believe. Totally free. Totally free. And uh, I, pay, I went to Brooklyn College and paid $12 a semester, so I, that is pretty much free, right? Okay. Uh, against reversing the work of the founders. And they were trying to make Medgar a two-year college instead of a four-year college, which they succeeded in doing for a short time, and then we got our four-year status back. While we lost these struggles at the beginning, we never gave up as we continued to build a school that empowered students to know their own history and culture and to become actors in making this school, the community, and this country a better place for all. Dr. Ta uh, Dr. Taylor and I came together when we teamed toward a course in the history of education and worked with books like Miseducation of the Negro and Pedagogy of the Oppressed. We also worked on the struggle of, the of 1982 to create a child care center and to rid the college of a president who had lost sight of the family's mission. While these struggles created a powerful bond with each other and the institution, it was you, the students, who had inspired me the most. As I came to understand the depths of your struggles to get an education, there was Lionel, an A student who sometimes slept in class. I'm sure some of you have done that too. Uh, as he struggled with three jobs, attending college and raising a family. Or Jacques, the student who had been a lawyer in Haiti, fought against Papa Doc and had to leave his country to start all over again in order to get a job in America, or Wanda, who was killed three months before graduation. As she laid on top of her children to protect them from the crossfire of the housing project she lived in. It was the world of these students, their commitment and dedication, their deep humanity and struggle that provided me with the inspiration that ultimately, ultimately led to the creation of this book. Through these student stories, I learned the profound meaning of racism and struggle. I connected to that fight against racial injustice through my own world, where members of my family had been killed in Europe because they were Jewish, or cousins who came to stay with me and uh, had numbers on their arms and were unable to talk about the horrors they had witnessed in the name of Aryan supremacy. And I connected because of my own mother, who woke up in the night in distress as she dreamt of the killings in her town as Russian soldiers rode through on horseback, killing Jews. While I had always struggled against racism, I came to understand the struggle in a new and profound and more personal way as I became more personally connected to the lives of my students. My love and respect for the college grew over the 34 years I spent here, and that because of this love and respect, and because of the importance of this college to the community, that led me to team up with a colleague and friend whose work I greatly respected, so as to write this book. I see this book as an ode to the founders, who sacrificed so much so they can come to this place to make a better life for themselves and their community. The story of this college is an important story that must be shared. It is a story of how a community struggle can change the lives of its members and bring, as President Barack Obama states, the audacity of hope to all. Thank you.
family. I have to say family because this is like homecoming. I have moved from New York. I currently live in Florida, which is sunny and warm right now. When I walked to the bus stop this morning and remembered, <clears throat> excuse me, how cold New York is, it was like, oh boy. Dr. Gibson, Mr. Jenkins, distinguished visitors, esteemed faculty and staff, and beloved students. It is my honor and pleasure to spend this time with you and share Dr. Tabor's and my thoughts about the story of this very important institution, Medgar Evers College. For those of you who do not know, I taught in Medgar Evers College for 25 years before retiring in 2003. During that time, I grew to love the college and in particular, its students. I came to the college from Brooklyn College, a place where I taught what is referred to there as Africana Studies. My office became a meeting place for so many students who felt a sense of alienation at that college, and I always felt a need to work with the Black Student Union and the Caribbean Student Union to bring social, cultural, political programs on campus, which would help students to grow. When I came to Mega Evans, I saw it as a place where I could work with a community of people who were interested in bringing change to this world. I saw it as a place where the community could be involved and the students would be given the chance to be all that they could be in order to benefit themselves, their individual families, and ultimately the larger city and the world community. I saw it as a place where the rich history and culture of Africa and her people, as well as the phenomenal culture and history of African Americans and Caribbean Americans and Latino Americans could be taught. While the college was predominantly African American when I first came, I grew to learn that we had over 76 different nationalities represented in this college. What a wonderful place, I thought, for exchanging culture and political information about each other, and to better understand each other's dreams and aspirations. I used to tell the students in my classes that by the end of the semester, <clears throat> it would be very important that we each learn something about someone else in the class that either came from a different country or a different part of the city or the United States. I urge them to get past our differences and salute those things that we have in common. Our classes would end each semester with a potluck party where each person would bring a dish that would be considered a national favorite in their place of birth. When I became the Associate Dean of the college, part of my responsibility was to work with the student government and the Women's Center to assist with the development of cultural and intellectual programs that included Kwanzaa, the annual tribute to the ancestors of the Middle Passage, which takes place out on Coney Island. I had once interviewed this great author, Tony K. Barbara, and during um, that interview, she noted the fact that we as African people, we as African people, descendants of African people, um, survivors of a time in history where we were not meant to survive, don't have a plaque, don't have a monument, don't have a museum, don't have anything that acknowledges those millions of people who are buried in that Atlantic Ocean as a result of being enslaved and brought here from Africa to the Caribbean and then to the United States. Dr. Mary Umalu, Sister Professor Queen, that recently passed from Medgar Evers, was in charge of organizing a Black Storytellers Conference at the time and thought this would be a wonderful time for us to have a tribute to those ancestors who are buried in the Atlantic Ocean, which is the largest single graveyard in the world. As a result of that, a committee was formed and we began the tribute to the ancestors of the Middle Passage. When I came to this college, I truly believed in the mission of the college, which was to serve the needs of the Central Brooklyn community, as, as it also addressed the larger interests and needs of New York City, which has always been, always been, a very racially divided city. The students and the community were my driving force. I always thought that a place called Medgar Evers College must be a place to force the change. Change in thinking and change in actions. There were students who always, always, always inspired me to want to be a better teacher, to be the best possible teacher 
And my community always inspired me with the notion that those of us who are successful are required to give back. There were always students who challenged my way of thinking and showed me that they appreciate what I was able to give to them. There were always students who were daring and wanted to dream the impossible dream, to take chances, to challenge the status quo, and work to create a better world or a better community. In many cases, just to create a better home and a better self. It is, of course, to you, the students, that I dedicate my remarks. When I came in Mega this morning, I met a brother who has been uh, a part of this college for numerous years, and he said to me, you know, one of the messages you need to give to these young people is, you are the ones that are in position to take over this world. My time has passed. You are in the position to take over the world, to create a new day. What do you want that world to look like? What do you want that world to be? Will it be a peaceful world? Will it be a world filled with war? Will it be a world where neighbor is fighting neighbor after borrowing milk from each other just yesterday? Will it be a world where your children can't go outside and play because you're worried that somebody might snatch them, or worse, they might get shot? What is the world that you want to create? There are people in this world who can recite their history for generations past, generations past, and who have planned for generations to come. Very often, we only think of today and tomorrow and perhaps five years from now, four years from now when I graduate. We have to begin to think not only of ourselves, but our children's children's children. What will be there for them? That is a part of our responsibility. It is interesting that we would be called upon to tell the story of Medgar Evers College during Black History Month. It is the beginning of a new semester, the first semester after the election of Barack Obama as President of the United States, a person who has inspired and challenged us to be more intelligent, to be more caring, to be more informed, and more willing to make sacrifices for the good of the whole. Don't just hear it on Fox News, Fox News and run with it. Unlike a lot of people in our community who may not even know how to negotiate a library, you know how to negotiate a library. You know how to seek out information. Don't just take the first rumor you heard and go with that and say, this is what's happening. If you want to know what Barack Obama is doing and, and with the stimulus, don't just chit chat. Go find out. Go on the website. I'm bad at the website, but I know this is your generation. <laughs> we, um, Sister Sophia Badella says, Well, I want to send you some emails of both Florence. And I said, Well, we might look at it every other win because I'm still on the phone, right? I mean, it just amazes me to see what young people are now doing with um, text messaging and emailing. So it's your generation. Information is right there for you. Go find it. Don't let the New York Post and Fox News and others like them tell you what's going on in the, in the world and in your community. Don't make somebody your enemy that doesn't look like you because somebody told you they are your enemy. What made them your enemy? What made them your enemy? Who's telling you that your enemy? There's nothing new. Malcolm X talked about that all the time. Don't let your enemies tell you who is your enemy. I am your friend, because of course they tried to make Malcolm X when he was alive an enemy of the black community. Um, and we all know that that is not true. <laughs> Dr. Taker and I decided to write the story of Medgar Evers' founding years as our way of ensuring that the world outside of Medgar would know the reality of this wonderful, wonderful place. We also, in addition to writing the history, wanted to write a book that not only would tell the history of the college, but also would tell the stories of some of the college's students. We interviewed several students from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and we'd like to come back and interview a few students of this time period to find out what did the college mean to them, what sacrifices did they have to make to attend college, we wanted the world to know that some of the challenges, some of the challenges and success stories of students who sometimes made it in spite of the odds. Students like Betty, who was homeless with her husband and children during her senior year, yet managed to graduate with honors and become an extraordinary teacher. Students like Tem Timothy, who like many of you, was the first in, in his family's history to attend college. Students like Flavia and Alice and Vincent and Norman and Anne and others who would risk everything, everything to participate in a student takeover to change the direction of the college. 
We interviewed several of these students and had the interviews transcribed, and that will be part two of the book. Well, actually, we'd like to see part one and part two as one book, but that will be on its way. We wanted the world to see Meg Evans through our eyes. The story of the founding of Medgar Evers College at the City University of New York is a heartfelt story told by us. We came together as committed faculty because for over 25 and 34 years respectively of teaching, we never doubted the importance of Medgar Evers' mission in the community, the city, and indeed the world. Though there have been differences of opinion between us, ideas, beliefs, we have always had mutual respect. In this way, we were able to confront our differences, celebrate our similarities, team teach, and always engage in the struggles of building this college. We contend that while the story of the college is of particular importance to Medgar Evers College family and community, it is also pertinent to all impoverished communities struggling around the world to build institutions that inspire community well-being. The short version of this amazing story is a community meets and demands the establishment of this college. A united community negotiating team confronts the Board of Higher Education and city politicians and, and racism, and eventually an agreement was reached that the college would be created. Work began, yet there were always tensions as members of the board were, total, were not totally in agreement with this college being created in what they considered a slum. While members of the negotiating team, headed by Assemblyman Al Van, insisted that there would be a college and it must be created to serve the needs of the community as defined by the community itself. When you read this story, one thing that you are certain to learn is the importance of organizing as it relates to our community. I think that one of the most astounding examples of the importance of organization in our recent history has been the organizing done by President Barack Obama. When he ran for president, how many of us really believe when he first announced his intentions to run for president that this young, brilliant, and also handsome African-American man would actually pull it off? One of the most important ingredients to his success was his organizing skills. His ability to get people from around the country to get involved and believe in the possibility of a better tomorrow. His slogan, Yes We Can, should be our slogan for life. And without knowing it, it was really the slogan of the founders of Mangrevis College. Our founders went against all odds in this city that had no intention of creating a college in what, as I said, the Board of Higher Education referred to as a slum. Their slogan, without knowing it, had to have been, Yes We Can. You may have heard the saying that those who do not know history are doomed to repeat history. This, I believe, is applicable here because as we see the wonderful new buildings being built on our beloved college, if the students, faculty, administrators, and community, which is always changing, don't know the history of the college, we might wake up one day to find that this beautiful, important institution belongs to some other folks than the ones that it was founded to serve. People, I suggest that we need to know the history of this college, for its history is our history. The story of struggle and sacrifice to uplift our community against the odds and against those who would keep us downtrodden. Yes, we are making progress, but progress is a watershed away from despair unless we are ever vigilant and committed to creating a better space through which our children's children will be able to travel. I wanted to read a piece from the book, but I'm going to skip that because I know time will run out and we do want to hear from you. But the piece basically tells you that when the founders of this um, college came together, it was during a time, an important time during the struggles of this city for better quality, quality of life, this country for equality and justice, and indeed in this world. And many of us, and many of those same people who were involved in the struggle for the founding of the college were people who were trying to create a better space in many ways for which, in which our children could grow. The cast of characters of the struggle to create the college ranged from, polit ranged from political leaders and religious leaders to what we call grassroots community organizers. There was a variety of political venues and perspectives which converged around the central idea of creating a college in central Brooklyn 
that will provide local youth with educational opportunities that allow them to effectively compete in a larger society. They believe this college would motivate younger students and encourage the growth of a professional class that would bring resources and greater ability to the college. An example of this dedication of the community can be witnessed through Ms. Ella Cease, a PTA activist in District 16 and one of the founders of the college. Ms. Cease's dream was to build a college for the youth of the community. And every Friday in the early 60s, she would sit at her kitchen table and write a letter to then Governor Rockefeller. In the letter, she would ask the governor to provide funds for a new high school and college in central Brooklyn. She persisted with this weekly activity for several years, and when one of the governor's hearings took place in Brooklyn, she showed up unannounced, insisted on speaking, and exclaimed to the governor, Central Brooklyn must have a college. People, the story of the fight for this college is an amazing story that everyone who attends this college or works at this college should know. This college did not come into being because of good white folks downtown thought it was about time for the black community to have a college. It came into being because of the consistency and persistency of a coalition of community people and organizations that convinced the Board of Higher Education and the city that this community needed and deserved to have a college, and the willingness of the community to work hard to see that this college would be developed. The theme of struggle is consistent throughout our book including the period when students demanded the creation of a daycare center and a women's center. A lot of you may have children that go to that daycare center and you take for granted that it was always there. It didn't exist. None of the administrators were even thinking about a daycare center for you until students decided that we will have a daycare center at Medgar Evers College. You have power, you just have to acknowledge it and move upon it and respect the people who are teaching you and trying to do, make this a better place for you. The daycare center and the women's center, which is still led by its founding director, Sister Sophia Vandelli, could we all just give her a round of applause as well are vital to this institution and should never, ever, ever be taken for granted. I feel that the most important thing I can say to you today is that you must continue to seek the truth and learn from history. I am certain that there are many of you who might wonder why you have been required to read a history book about this college when you have so many other requirements for graduation. My answer is simply that, through your reading, reading and discussions, you will be better prepared to see the sacrifices it takes to struggle for your goals and the organization that is necessary to achieve them. None of us walks on this earth alone, even when we are in our loneliest moments. We are always walking with those who came before us, those who paved our way. It is not just your hard work alone that makes for achievement. It is our collective hard work that will create a new day where equity and justice will prevail. Thank you very much.